right, there we go. Now we're live in the group, yay. All right. Awesome, well, hello everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, sharing part of your Wednesday night with us. Uh, tonight, I'm super excited. We have a really special guest tonight, uh, Nick Ross. He is going to share a little bit about his experience with us as well as diving into some some information and some techniques that we can use to help improve our minds and our outlook on things as well as ways that we can be more positive and have a better outlook for each and every single day so nick i'm going to go ahead and let you kind of introduce yourself much better than that and we'll kind of go from there if you have yeah. questions just drop them in the chat and we'll get those taken care of for you guys well, once again, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Uh, appreciate being here and excited to to be able to talk to everyone. Like the really quick story about me is uh, I grew up in Northeast Pennsylvania in the Pocono Mountains. I grew up on a 75 acre horse farm my whole entire childhood from birth to the age of 18. And I worked my rear end off shoveling horse manure, building fences and working on this very large farm with very expensive horses. And I was an only child. Um, and so if you understand farm work, usually very large families, well, there's very few of us and there's a lot of work split up in some child labor laws were probably broken, definitely when I was growing up. Um, and what I quickly realized is that uh, in order to get off of the farm, if I played sports or I had practice, I didn't have to work. So I would play sports year round and my whole entire dream, my whole entire life growing up, uh, really kind of poor underprivileged farmers was to you know, make it to be a professional athlete, like a lot of young boys to go play pro sports. And when I was 16 years old, uh, that dream was very, very real to me. And it was something that I was chasing to go play for a D1 college to go play ice hockey. And when I was 16, I was in a very uh, horrific car accident with another 16 year old driving. Uh, we were on the way to the mall. If you guys have heard of those things are still around to go get some tuxedos for the high school fashion show. Right. And so like this really pointless activity uh, really kind of caught up in vanity and being a young kid nearly ended my life. We got T-boned at 65 miles an hour, crossing over a highway um, intersection, and I got hit directly in the passenger seat. And I don't remember any of it. I was ripped out of the car with jaws of life, medevac to the hospital. And that was the end of my dream as a very young child. And the reason I tell you that is because that's really the beginning of my journey where all of my problems happened. And I started to deploy soothing techniques that I had learned and modeled from my parents, as we all do when we're four and five years old. And the things that I saw and the ways that my parents soothed their pain was through drugs and alcohol. And so when I became a child, or when I was 16 and I had my dream then ripped away from me, the only thing that I knew to do was to do damage to myself. I didn't know it at that time. And I continued to live that lifestyle. I had success in my career. I was in a music career for 15 years. I live in Nashville, Tennessee. I absolutely love it here, but I came here because of the music industry. And like many things in the music industry, my life as a single bachelor for 16 years was the rock and roll lifestyle. I was a bachelor. Um, I drank, I smoked a pack of cigarettes. I ate whatever I wanted to eat. I ate out all the time. I ate fast food. And my favorite thing to eat was Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Like I was, had a really bad, embarrassing addiction to Ben and Jerry's. And over a 16 year period from 16 to the age of 32, like many of us, we just continue to live that lifestyle, run these frameworks and these models and these soothing techniques for stress and fear and pain and lack of unworthiness and and insignificance that we all feel, that we all feel these. If you're human, you feel these emotions. And our parents taught us to soothe these pains from a very young age instead of facing them head on. And at the age of 32, um, never been married, didn't have, wasn't in a serious relationship, had a career where I was making, you know, what I thought then was decent money uh, and had an apartment with really nothing in it. And I could never be home alone. I would always get done with work. Uh, I had a high level management job. It was stressful and I'd go out. I was always at two for ones or Taco Tuesday or bowling or someone's birthday or a football game. Like I was always out doing something because I could never be home alone. I hated it. And uh, when I was the age of 32, I was home alone and uh, I woke up that morning and I had this lump in my throat and I don't know why, but the very first thing, and I'm not like some paranoid person was that I have cancer in my throat 
And well, no duh, you've been smoking a pack of marble reds for 16 years. And at that time, I never, I couldn't tell you who my general doctor was. If you asked me, I didn't even have one, but I made a doctor's appointment. She saw me that month of March of 2016. I, my apartment caught on fire. <laughs> I had four wisdom teeth removed surgically at the age of 32. I got the flu for the first time in my life. And then on the third week of March, so this all happened within three weeks of each other. I had this lump in my throat. She says, you're fine. It's a reaction to being sick. Your top, your, um, your wisdom teeth being taken out. Here's some antibiotics. Well, I went home, continued my lifestyle, probably poured a whiskey and playing some video games, but I still didn't feel right. I, like something was really speaking to me that internally something was wrong. And I went and I took a shower and for some reason, I just decided to examine myself and my testicles and I found a lump and it was like 12 o'clock at night and my heart, literally, you talk about that feeling, it, it, you feel it go into your stomach. And I did the worst thing that you could probably do, which is I went on to WebMD and read what it said. And it said, if you touch it and it does not hurt. It's uh, most likely a tumor that could be possibly cancerous. If it does hurt, it's not those things, but go still see a doctor. Um, and so I didn't sleep. I woke up on a Friday morning. I live in Nashville, pretty populated city. There's a network of 40 urologists here, and none of them had an availability for me to go see them. And I'm on the phone with the receptionist crying in the morning. Like, I think I have cancer. Please find me a doctor to talk to. And he's a saint. I love him. His name is Dr. Balsante. He was a young oncologist. I mean, a urologist. He foregoed his lunch break to go see me. It's a 45 minute drive. I go do all the tests. I knew then when I looked at him, examining me, I just knew. Uh, he said, it's the weekend. We got to look at your images and we'll call you on Monday or we'll contact you on Monday. Well, from the time I drove from his office to my home, which was 45 minutes, I walk in, this is always hard to talk about, six years ago. I walk into that apartment where I own nothing and I am insignificant and that I hate to be there and I am all alone and my phone rings. And I know now ethically they're not supposed to do this because of the severity of the issue he called me. And on the other line, I pick up the phone and he says, Nick, you have cancer, you have surgery on Monday. And in that moment, the very, very first thing and of all of the limitless possibilities of things that could have went through my mind at that time, the thing that really drives me to this day is that I had done that to myself, that I had deserved that, that the person that I was and the things that I did to my body, right, had caused the cancer. Um, and the doctors told me if I did not find my tumor when I did Two months later, my chance of survival would have been 9%. And I, I think about, what if you didn't find it? What would you have been doing for those two months, Nick? You would have been doing the same thing you did every day, day after day after day. You would have done the things you knew you should not have done, but you did them anyways. Because I knew I was doing damage to myself. I knew I was hurting myself. I knew I was turning my blind eye from the truth. And the universe, God, the collective consciousness, whatever you align to spiritually, it is exacting at rewarding you for your worth. And at that time, God put his hand around my neck. I believe this firmly and said, son, wake up, wake up, because I would have died an inconsequential man. That is the fact. I had some successes in my life. I had some trophies that were dusty. So what? But. What drives me today is that, one, I will always take care of this vessel and this body because it went through chemotherapy. And two, is that I refuse to go through that feeling again. At the age of 32, I knew and I felt what it was like to be on a deathbed, what it is to be 76 years old. The average age of an American lives to 76. How many 76-year-olds are living and on their deathbed or older and regretting the decisions or non-decisions and non-action they did not take in their life. And I felt that existential weight at 32. And once I got better, I made a promise to God that I'd never put myself in that situation again. That when it is my day, when I do have to go, 
that I have no regrets because I do understand one thing, guys, is we want results in our life, especially when it comes to self-development, spiritually, mentally, uh, emotionally, intellectually, physically, all of that takes discipline. And so I had to ask myself, there's two types of pain in this world, guys. There's the pain of discipline and there's the pain of regret. The pain of discipline is weighed in ounces. The pain of regret is weighed in tons. So you ask yourself, what do I want to carry around for the rest of my life? Do I want to carry around that existential weight, my boulder that weighs tons of regret because I knew I should have done that, but I didn't? Or are we going to carry around the weight of discipline? So at this point in my life, I found that there is the ultimate freedom in discipline. And that seems oxymoronic, but adding discipline to your life, a routine, a schedule, positive habits can radically transform your life. And that's what I believe why I'm alive today to help people understand. No, I agree 100%. And it can, it's like you say, it's, we think that being disciplined is, you know, something that's hard, like it's a chore that we have to work at it and we do, but you're right. It gives us so much freedom. It does. It, and it doesn't seem like that at first because mm -hmm. for many people, we don't get the results that we want in our life because we identify as someone that can't support the outcome. Mm -hmm. And that's so a true. lot of people don't get what they want or they won't become disciplined because who they identify with is like, well, I don't want to be disciplined. Mm -hmm. But that, what I find is the imposter, the internal critic, the self-sabotager, that, that talk track, that internal dialogue that's in our head says, ah, I don't want to get up on the first alarm. Ah, I don't want to do the cardio. I don't want to have to drink the extra cup of water. I don't want to eat the other eight ounces of chicken. I don't like whatever it is. I don't want to have to read the 30 minutes of book or listen to a self-development podcast, you know, an hour a day, you know, getting up at 4 30 AM, you know, that's, it's because your identity is much more comfortable doing what it likes to do, but you are the one in control, not the talk track. So you know, helping people become aware of that and who is actually having the conversation in your head. It's like, as soon as you start to identify wins and small wins in your life, and you can get those wins repeatedly, you could build self-confidence and self-esteem. Those progressing wins in our life can only be found through disciplined action, right? Like disciplined thoughts, disciplined words, disciplined action. And it, this isn't, you know, who else is going to do it for you? Who else is going to discipline you? Like, no one wants to be disciplined. No one wants to be put in a corner and time out, but we have to do it for ourselves. It's the only way that you then create the identity that sees those freedoms, that sees more choices, because that's what freedom is. Freedom is having more choices. And so when you take care of yourself, when your mind is feeling right, when your body's at homeostasis, when your hormones are operating properly, because you're putting proper foods and exercise and the right neurotransmitters are releasing in your brain and your mind, that be creates more freedom because you're able to perceive more. You're able to filter and take in more of life's wonders and joy. But we can't do that unless we push past our own limiting false beliefs. Right. No, 1000%. What is, um, you mentioned the, the inner talk, our inner critic, the bad things we say to ourselves. What have you found to be super helpful with getting that to shut up? <laughs> well, the inner critic, the imposter syndrome is the, the, the best thing to realize is that you're always going to have it and that the imposter, the internal critic, if you didn't hear it, then you would be a narcissist or a sociopath, right? And let's also realize that people who suffer from imposter syndrome and internal critic are usually people who want to achieve and that are doing something, right? They're usually the successful people. So it actually is a sign that you're a reasonable, conscientious person that you have that. So let's first realize that the imposter is not the enemy, that we actually have to befriend it in a way, because it's a reminder like, hey, you should get off the couch and go do something. Hey, you should finish and go complete the 12K steps today. 
hey, you should, you know, do whatever the next task is, the work, send the extra email, send the other tasks that you have to complete, you know, cleaning up things like, you know, you should clean up this mess. It's been sitting there for how long? Like, let's take care of it. And so all of those are a reflection of that internal dialogue. Now, what I want people to do is instead is communicate with their highest self, their calling, right? But that is so hard to do when there's so much noise going in on your head. If the space is preoccupied by the internal critic, the self-sabotager, and the imposter syndrome, you have three people talking in your head, plus the three masks you're wearing in your life, the person you are in public, the person you are with friends and family, and the true person you are when you're alone by yourself, all of that dialogue is going in your head because we all have personality types that we put on in front of others, right? And so now we have all this noise. That's what it is. It's noise in the talk track of our mind. Well, how can I communicate with someone if there's all this noise around me? And the thing is about our highest potential, God, whoever you believe is communicating directly to you, they don't yell at you. Your dreams don't yell at you. The visions of your life don't yell at you. They whisper. They whisper in your ear. Hey, you should really get this done. Hey, you can. No. Nick, you froze. Is he frozen for you guys too? Do this. Ah, there we go. My back? Yes. Sorry yeah, about sure. that. That's okay. That happened on my last one too, so it really might be me. Um so where did you lose me at? Sorry about that. <laughs> you were telling, you were starting to tell us um, there's the three people in your head and three personalities that we have and everyone is talking and we can't listen to anyone because everyone is talking. Yes. And then I, I, I don't know if I said this part, but I'll pick up here is that our dreams, our vision, God, all of the highest, the calling that we feel like our instincts that we can be more and do more and help more and contribute more, all of that whispers in your ear. It does not screaming and yelling at you like, hey, you got to get this done. Hey, you could be this person. Hey, you could impact this life. It's more like, hey, you could do this. But you can't hear it when all of this negative talk track and noise is going on in your head, right? And so it, it's a very simplistic way of, of thinking about it, but also realize that that voice is not who you are. You are the realization of that voice. And so therefore you actually control the dialogue. Like the other thing is, is giving yourself an emotional driver. You know, a lot of people think they need to be motivated to be disciplined. And that's a lie. Motivation is fleeting. There's nothing important about motivation. The only thing that anyone needs to know about motivation is what you do when you are not motivated. When you're not motivated to go do the things required to take care of yourself, to get up out, to stop binge watching, to stop ordering the food. So it's like, that's what matters. When you don't feel like doing it, do you go do it? Because that's how the winning is done. That's how you start building the self-confidence that lowers the volume of all of those people. Because now you'd be like, no, I can do this. Shut up. Shut up. No, watch me do this. And then you lower the volume of that identity. And then we can start communicating with our highest potential, our highest self. And that talk starts going through our mind. Like you can accomplish this. You are worthy. You are enough. But because typically most of us live in a fear-based survival-based state in our body, it's hard to communicate. It's hard to talk to that person, but they're there. Just got to tune them in. Right. 
Yeah, no, I think that's so important. And it is, it's very hard to listen over all of the noise we like to have in our own heads. Um, so if you were going to tell a person like, what is the best thing that they could do for themselves to improve their mindset? Yeah, it's it's answering, it's having an answer for these two questions, all right? The first question that most people can't answer is this, which is who are you? Mm -hmm. Who are you? Who do you actually identify as? Because once again, this is the big takeaway. If you are not getting the results that you want in your life, it's because you identify as someone who can't support those outcomes. So we just have to identify, like, let me, let me break this down. I cannot become a successful entrepreneur and business person until I start thinking and acting like one first. If you want to become a fit person and a healthy person, you have to start thinking, talking, and acting like a fit, first, fit person first, and then you will change your identity to one because you will start getting evidence criteria that you are capable of doing these things. So it's a trick question in a way. Because no one really can answer this. They don't know who they are. They really don't. And the answer to it, who you are, is you are the person who changes themselves. You are, the, you are the becoming. You are the becoming. So you are currently here in point A, where you currently are stuck, but you prefer not to be. This is pain. This is where I prefer not to be. And you want to be up here. This is your highest self. This is possibility. This is your vision. This is your dream. Well, from point A to point B, there's a gap. That's the becoming. That's who you are. You are the person who changes themselves. And there's no better person. There's no one in a better position to change your life than you. Okay? And so when I'm reaching for above me, I'm reaching for something higher than me. I'm reaching for my highest self. I have to expand my container in order to reach it. And to expand my container, I need to acquire knowledge on things that I'm passionate about, serve and help other people with the gifts that God get, has given me. You have to put something above you. That becomes your mission. That, that's at, what's at the top of your your values, your hierarchy of values and beliefs. And so you reach towards it by responsibility, by taking care of yourself first, because your lack of your best hurts everyone that you love. Mothers and fathers love to blame their kids as to why they're not getting excuses or getting results. They love to do that. And I challenge mothers and fathers all the time. No, your lack of best mommy and best father is actually hurting your children right now and their future. So one, we have to understand, who am I identifying with? Am I identifying as someone that I don't want to be? Because if I'm identifying with that person, my whole world and filter of reality is filtered through that identity. And it's you change it in a decision, guys. Changing your life doesn't take a year, five years, or 10 years. It takes right now. A decision. There's two types of decisions. Decisions that are made and decisions that are not made. Make a decision. The second thing is, what do you want? And this is the question that I answer all day long. Nick, how do I figure out what I want? Okay. Now, I can't tell you what you want, but I can tell you how to figure out how to get it. And I will tell you, that when I was a sick man and I was getting eight hours of chemotherapy five days a week, every other week for two months, the heaviest chemo a 32-year-old man can go through, work shifts, 40 hours a week of chemotherapy. I only wanted one thing at that point in my life. I wanted to survive. That's it. And I was willing to do whatever it took to survive including crawl from my bed to my car so my mom could drive me to the hospital on day five of the cycle so I could go watch other men and women shrivel to nothing. And when I wanted one thing and I was willing to do anything for it, survival, remember, 
A sick man wants but one thing. A healthy man wants but everything. And therefore, he gets nothing. And I learned that. So I, I asked myself, Nick, when you were willing to do whatever it took to survive and you accomplished the hardest thing in your life and you got better, the question became, well, Nick, if you apply the same skill sets and the same attributes and the same mindset to defeating cancer as to every area of your life, your relationships, your body, your nutrition, your spirit, your acquired knowledge, your business, family man, all of those areas of my life, I apply that same mindset, that one singularity, one thing. And so you have to figure out, I want this one thing more than I want anything. And I typically find that it comes from helping and serving others from what you lacked as a child. It's called the plight of the broken. We all want to fix in others, which was once broken in us. It's what I'm doing. It's what you're doing. It's what makes us feel the best. It's the way that we get fulfillment. It's a communitarian style of self-development because it feels really good to help other people and watch them win. And so then when you can use your areas of giftedness, those few areas that God given, has given you. And by the way, I have like one or two. I'm not special at all. I promise you I'm just a dumb old farmer hick from the mountains, right? Like my whole life. And so you have to get down to that singularity. You have to then get an emotional driver. What, like for me, my emotional driver is the promise I made to God. I said, God, you give me a second chance at life on my hands and knees. I will use my few gifts to serve other people. And that's my promise. I have removed everyone from my life that has asked me to break that promise. Best friends, people in my family, ex-coworkers, business owners, and girlfriends alike. I will not break that. That is my emotional driver. And then my other emotional driver is my mother and the promises I made to her that I'm still chasing. I'm about to be 39 in a few months. And so when Nick doesn't want to do it, how do I look myself in the mirror and say, no, Nick, go ahead and take the day off, take the play off. Because if I make my goals just about me, it's not enough to get them done. You have to have an emotional driver. That's what fills up your tank, guys, not motivation. You have to look forward to the results, but in order to get the results, you have to make a decision to start today. So one, become aware that who you are is the person who changes themselves. You are the becoming. And two, figure out what you want. The simple exercise is not on your computer, not on your phone, on a piece of paper with a pen or pencil. I want you to write down 20 goals that you have. They could be a year, five-year, 10-year goal. doesn't matter. Just 20 goals that you have. They could be buy a PlayStation, go on a vacation, buy a new car, buy a new home, get my kids in the best school, to lose 20 pounds, to acquire more knowledge, to go back to school, to buy a pair of red bottoms, whatever. Okay? 20 goals on the piece of paper. It's called brainstorming. Then I want you to take those 20 goals and I want you to organize them in a priority of the top five. So the top five, most important. The other 15 goals, you just throw them to the side. They are not important. They are the distractions. Those are the shiny objects you're going to squirrel about. Look, oh, you know, I do it all the time. I want new toys, but no, it's not relevant to my goals that I have right now. So now you're left with five goals. These are the goals that you should be willing to do whatever it takes for. And now we create, and I know we're running out of time, we create five actionable steps a day in order to make those dreams come to life. So for me, and I'll use an example, I have a goal to become a professional bodybuilder, right? At this point, it's going to be seven years removed from cancer. And I never worked out a day in my life before cancer. Now that dream, as I told you, I was a 16 year old boy. Well, to, and I want to become a professionally a professional athlete. Well, I still, I'll be 40 when I accomplish it. I become a professional athlete, athlete. I will. And that is to keep a promise I made to my mom when I was a six-year-old boy. Right. And I'm still here trying to make that happen. It's like, it's 487 days away, December 3rd, 2023. Okay. And I have to get five things done every day in order to re reinforce that goal. I got, I have to wake up at 4.30 a.m. 
I have to eat my meal plan exactly as my coach told me. I have to do my cardio. And then for me, I have to acquire knowledge every day. If I can give you one piece of advice, 30 minutes of AQ, acquired knowledge a day. On a, not on murder mysteries, not on, and I love this shit, not on anything that is not relevant to self-development. It has to be self-development related, right? A great subject I love, Tony Robbins teaches it all day long, is NLP, Neuro Linguistics Programming. It's fascinating. You can apply it to your life. You can apply it to your family's life, and it will make the quality of your life great. So 30 minutes of AQ. And um, lastly, it was for a while, also read 15 pages of a book. Right now, I'm trying to learn how to do the splits. I don't know how that's relative to bodybuilding, but it makes me really flexible. I saw some people do it. I was like, that's really cool. Let's see how long it takes me to learn how to do the splits. So that's on there right now. Good for you. <laughs> that's awesome. So these five things, then you just do them every single day in order to reach that outcome. For me, I have a very extreme goal. So I am very extreme on the repetitive nature, but the design of the philosophy that I just taught you is if you do any of those tasks. So if I, you know, if I went on my 5k steps, 20 days and 20, whatever, tw not whatever, 21 days in a row, then I would increase it slightly and start scaling that goal as well. It's hard for me to scale the goal because I have to do exactly as my bodybuilding coach tells me just because where I am in the fitness and health, I'm on the extreme end. So I do have to have extreme discipline. So I use it to stay extremely focused. Yes, but the goal is to do these things for is, is 21 days a long enough time and then we can we can increase the, the goal a little bit more or not. If the you goal accomplished it 21 it's, days in a row. If you accomplished it 21 days in a row, I read the 15 pages 21 days in a row, scale it to 20 pages, right? There's just slight incremental scaling of those goals every 21 days that you accomplished it in a row. The idea is if you do something 21 days in a row, it now starts to wear a groove in your brain and become a habit. So it now becomes a pathway for, you know, the basically neurons and electricity in your mind to have an easier path for the behavior or the outcome that's desired. Right. And then that lets you stack small wins too, because you were successfully completed something. So now you can move on to like the next level. Right. And that builds self-confidence, self-esteem. And that is what slowly, incrementally over time, all those small wins that you deposit, you're depositing in them into the bank of your highest self, right? It's just like a bank. You put, put in, put in, put in, you're going to get a massive return some point in the future. So the question becomes, what am I willing to sacrifice over the shortest amount of time for the greatest possible good in my life? Am I willing to sacrifice alcohol and the snacks and this and that and these social events for the shortest amount of time possible to get the goal that I want? And that's really what it comes down to. Okay. No, that makes it so so much more manageable, I think, too. Yes. Yeah. You, it's called chunking down. In NLP, you take big goals and you chunk them down until they are appropriate bite-sized pieces that you can continually increase the self-confidence as you basically level up. Your, that's what you are doing at each stage. Yeah, leveling up. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to check Facebook real quick for any questions. If anyone here on the call with us has questions, you can unmute or you can drop them in the chat box. We have a lot of likes on Facebook, but no questions. I also didn't remind them very well that they could ask. They should know. Um, All good. All right. Um, if we're good here, we can go ahead and stop taking up so much of your evening. Yes, time for uh, one last eight ounces of chicken. Oh, yay. <laughs> 300, 320 grams of chicken or 320 grams of protein a day at this point. Yeah. But you have a very specific goal. So. Yes, definitely. Well, thank you so much for your time tonight, Nick. And thank you for explaining how that process works and how we can, we can just have a better outlook and also be more successful at it, I think, too.
Well, my absolute pleasure. If anyone ever has any questions, you reach out to me on Instagram. It's just uh, at Nick Ross Speaks. So appreciate your time. Absolutely. Oh, and you know what, guys? Um, Nick actually has a podcast and it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful. Um, what is it called again, Nick? It's Circle the W. Yeah. So you're literally circling the W on a calendar, the win for the day, right? Perfect. All right. Yeah. So I don't know if any of you are into podcasts, but I certainly enjoy that one. And they're not your your podcasts aren't super long, which is part of the reason I love them, because you can like listen to it and have this great piece of positivity and then, you know, go on with your day. So That's the plan. <laughs> they're wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, go ahead and stop taking up so much of your time tonight. Thanks again for joining us. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Chris, thank you, Nick. You're welcome. Have a good night.